Hi everyone, Chad Pitts here. This time talking to you about Rule 13 putting greens. Rule 13 is a specific rule for the putting green. Putting greens are special places. They are prepared for playing the ball along the ground. There's a flag stick for the hole on each putting green. So certain and different rules apply than for many other areas of the golf course. And we're gonna talk about some of those. We're gonna talk about when a ball is on or off the putting green, what constitutes that. We're gonna talk about improvements that are allowed on the putting green, which have been expanded and liberalized. We're gonna talk about what you do when a ball or ball marker moves on a putting green. So let's get into it. This rule allows the player to do things on the putting green that are normally not allowed anywhere else on the course. You know a lot of these things already, but just to reiterate some of them, this means you're allowed to mark, lift, clean, and replace a ball. You're also allowed to repair damage. The amount of damage that you're allowed to repair has been expanded in 2019. You're also allowed to remove sand and loose soil on the putting green. Additionally, there is no penalty for accidentally causing a ball or ball marker to move on the putting green. As long as the movement was caused accidentally, no penalty. So, how do we tell if a ball is on a putting green or not? Many times it's extremely easy to tell. But if you have a ball that seems to be on there half and half, if you will, half on the fringe, half on the green, where does it lie? Well, if any part of the ball is touching the putting green, then the ball lies on the putting green. And therefore, you're allowed to mark the ball, lift it, clean it, those sorts of things. If the ball is lying on another object, such as a loose impediment or an obstruction, and the ball is inside the edge of the putting green, then the ball is considered to also be on the putting green. So even though the ball isn't technically touching the putting green in that instance, it is still, per the rules of golf, considered to be on the putting green. During a round, and also while play stopped, if there's a weather suspension or darkness suspension, a player is allowed to improve some things on the putting green. They're allowed to take these two actions, which are the removal of sand and loose soil and the repair of damage, no matter whether the ball is on or off the putting green. So it doesn't matter if your ball's on the fringe, out in the fairway, if there's sand and loose soil on the putting green, you can remove it. If your ball is on the fringe or out in the fairway, if there's some damage on the putting green you wanna repair, including a ball mark perhaps, or spike marks, you can repair that damage as long as the damage itself lies on the putting green. We don't care where the ball's at in this instance. Just remember, with the removal of sand and loose soil, you can only do it on the putting green. So if you've got, say someone hits a shot from a bunker and there's a big trail of sand, that has deposited itself on the fringe and also on the putting green. You could remove the part that's on the putting green, but you can't remove the stuff that's on the fringe. Repair a damage. A player may repair damage on the putting green without penalty as long as they take reasonable actions and they're doing so to restore the putting green as nearly as possible to its original condition. And here's a video of some of that. We do put some restrictions on how you can repair this damage. So what can you use to repair damage like spike marks or imperfections, um, you know, uh, ball marks, whatever? Well, you can use your hand, you can use your foot, you can use another part of the body. You can also use a normal ball mark repair tool, a T, uh, a club, if you will, to tap things down. You can also use any other item of normal equipment that you'd normally have with you during the course of a round of golf. But you have to do all of this without unreasonably delaying play. If you're taking way too long to repair all this damage, 
then you might not get penalized under Rule 13.1c. The act of actually repairing the stuff wouldn't be the penalty, but if you took a really long time to do it, you could get penalized under 5.6, which would be delaying play. And just keep in mind that if you approve the putting green by taking actions that exceed what is considered reasonable, such as restoring the putting green in a way that creates a pathway to the hole or by using an object that's not allowed, which would be an object that you wouldn't normally carry with you in the course of a round of golf, then you would get the penalty for a breach of this rule. Or excuse me, a breach of actually rule 8.1, which is the conditions affecting the stroke. So let's talk about what we mean by damage. Well, damage on the putting green means any damage uh, caused by a person or outside influence. And obviously there's a person there on the left picture. There's what would be considered an outside influence on the right, which is the uh, giant elk or moose. Some examples of damage that you are allowed to fix include ball marks, uh, shoe damage such as spike marks or, or shoe scrapes, uh, indentations caused by someone's club or the flagstick. Uh, you can repair old hole plugs. Uh, old turf plugs. Uh, if there's some sod seams, you're allowed to repair that. If there are some scrapes or indentations from maintenance tools or vehicles, you're going to be allowed to repair that. Uh, if there's animal tracks or hoof indentations, most likely here in Iowa, it's going to be deer hooves. You're going to be allowed to repair that. You also are allowed to repair damage on the putting green made from embedded objects, such as a stone, uh, an acorn, or a tee. But here's what doesn't count. Here's what you cannot repair. Um, you cannot repair uh, damage from normal practices for maintaining the overall condition of the putting green. Uh, these would be things like aeration holes or grooves from uh, vertical mowing, otherwise known as verticutting. Uh, you're not going to be allowed to repair that stuff. What Typically, if we've got aeration holes on putting greens, we, we might write a local rule to grant relief if your ball lies in one of those holes. But if that local rule is not in place, you wouldn't, you're not able to um, repair the hole itself. So typically with aeration holes, a lot of times you're going to uh, potentially have a local rule in place that day that would grant relief if your ball lies in an aeration hole. Uh, but just know that... Uh, the rules itself do not grant relief from an aeration hole in this instance. It also doesn't include damage from irrigation, rain, or other natural forces. So, you know, that's just considered temporary water in many of those cases, the, the first two, or including the picture on the right. Also doesn't include natural surface imperfections, such as weeds, areas of bare, diseased, or uneven growth, you know, that's just kind of the course you have that day, and that's what you're going to have to deal with. And it also includes natural wear of the hole, you know. Um, sometimes holes just have a little bit of natural wear to them, especially if they uh, aren't being cut every day. They could, you know, be cut maybe once or twice a week, and you're going to see a little bit of wear to that hole. Well, that's you're not allowed to repair that. That's just kind of considered normal wear and tear. Okay, let's talk about um, when a ball or ball marker moves on a putting green and what you should do. There are two specific rules for a ball or ball marker that moves on a putting green. We're going to talk about if you accidentally cause the ball or ball marker to move and how there's not a penalty anymore. Then we're going to go into when you are to replace the ball that's moved by natural forces. Okay, there's no penalty for accidentally causing the ball to move. If the player causes it, the opponent, another player in stroke play, uh, you're on the putting green, the ball or ball marker is accidentally moved, there's no penalty, uh, and you're gonna put it back. Again, no penalty for accidentally causing the ball to move in this instance. Um, the player must replace the ball in its original spot, and if you don't know the exact spot, which in that video a couple times they didn't know the exact spot. So all they have to do is estimate it. Just get as close as you possibly can. So you're either going to replace the ball in its original spot or you could also place a ball marker to mark that original spot. And again, if you don't know it, you estimate it. If the player or opponent deliberately lifts the player's ball or ball marker on the putting green, you're going to refer to a different rule uh, to find out if there's a penalty. So if it's accidental, that's fine. No 
problem, no penalty. If it's deliberate, then we got to figure out exactly what the situation is to determine if there is a penalty or not. Okay, so let's talk about when to replace a ball that's moved by natural forces, all right? And really what you end up doing here is you ask yourself one question. Have I already marked and replaced the ball? If you've already marked and replaced the ball, no matter what causes it to move, you are going to replace it back on that spot or get as close as you possibly can and replace the ball. If you have not already marked the ball, then you play the ball where it ends up. So if natural forces cause a player's ball on the putting green to move, where the player must play from next depends on whether the ball has already been lifted and replaced on the original spot. So ball that's already been marked and lifted and replaced, you put it back. A ball that you haven't done that with yet, you haven't touched it yet, you haven't marked it yet, uh, you will play it from where it ends up. Ball already lifted and replaced, the ball must be replaced on the original spot. Estimated if you don't know it exactly. Even though it's moved by natural forces and not by the player, the opponent, or an outside influence. And here's a video of Tiger. And it's really hard to see, but what happens, Tiger's already marked, lifted, and replaced the ball. And what happens is either Tiger accidentally causes it to move or... In this case, I believe it's just simply gravity causes the ball to move just slightly. So because he's already marked and lifted and replaced it, he is following the rules properly and putting the ball back where it was. If a ball has not already been lifted and replaced, then you simply play it from the new spot. So the example I always use is say you hit a shot from the middle of a fairway 150 yards out the ball comes to rest on the putting green. In the course of walking up, which might take you a few minutes to do, the ball all of a sudden rolls to a new position. Because you haven't marked, lifted, and replaced the ball yet, you just simply play it from where it ends up. So a ball not already lifted and replaced, the ball must be played from the new spot. Now let's talk about the flag stick, 13.2. This rule covers the player's choices for dealing with the flag stick some of which changed in 2019. You're allowed to leave the flagstick in now, for instance, on the putting green. Leaving flagstick in the hole. The player can leave the flagstick in the hole. You can now make a stroke from anywhere on the golf course and leave the flagstick in the hole. Here's the caveat. You have to decide before the stroke that you're either going to A, leave the flagstick in the hole. You can also move it back so that it's centered in the hole. You could also, if a flagstick has already been removed, put it back in the hole because you want it in for your stroke. But in either case, you're not allowed to take or gain an advantage by deliberately moving the flagstick to a position other than centered. So if for some reason you feel like it's a, you want to leave the flagstick in the hole, but you want it uh, leaning away from you, well, you're not allowed to do that and move the flagstick into that position. If you're gonna move the flagstick at all, the only thing you can do is make it more centered. And ultimately what determines whether you get a penalty is whether the ball in motion then hits the flagstick. So if you've moved the flagstick in a position that is not centered and is in some other position that would give you an advantage and then ultimately end up striking it with your ball, then that would be a penalty. If the player makes a stroke with the flagstick left in the hole and the ball in motion then hits the flagstick, there is no penalty and the ball has to be played as it lies. Hopefully the ball was holed and congratulations, you finished the hole and you're going to the next one. But if it simply strikes the flagstick and deflects off to the side, there's no penalty. The ball has to be played as it lies. Again, this is assuming that you either left the flagstick as is when you got up there or just left it simply centered. The part we just covered a moment ago was if you had moved that flagstick to a position other than centered that was going to give you advantage and then your ball struck it, then you would get penalized. There is a limitation on the player moving or removing the flagstick while a ball's in motion. So, after making a stroke with the flagstick left in the hole, the player and his or her caddy cannot deliberately move or remove the flagstick 
to effect where the ball, the player's ball in motion might come to rest. Usually this would mean the ball's in motion and for some reason you or your caddy think the ball is going to strike the flag stick so you run up quick and remove it. Nope. You made the decision before your stroke that you wanted that flag stick left in, therefore you have to leave it in the whole time. So in the video, or the little clip on the right there, um, the player hits the, hits the ball, the caddy thinks that the ball is gonna come and hit it, so they, they go up and remove the flag stick. Then in that case, in that case, there would be a penalty. Now, there is sort of an exception to this. If you or your caddy or another player um, you know, reason to believe, or it's certainly reasonable to believe that the ball that's currently in motion, if it's not going to hit the flag stick, uh, even before the ball comes to rest, if you remove that flag stick, um, that's going to be okay. So say in this picture on the right, you've got a ball that's not quite to the hole yet, but basically almost to the hole. And it's become obvious that, look, there's no way this thing's going to hit the flag stick. It's, you know, two feet to the left and, and moving past if the flag stick gets removed at that point, uh, there's no penalty because it didn't, it didn't have a chance of affecting the ball in motion. And now that we are allowing you to leave the flag stick in the hole, we expanded the definition of when a ball has been holed to allow for a ball that is resting against the flag stick, yet not entirely below the surface of the hole to be considered hold. If a player's ball comes to rest against the flag stick left in the hole, if any part of the ball is in the hole below the surface of the putting green, the ball is treated as hold. So in the picture on the right, that ball would be considered hold. Keep in mind, you do have to at least have some of the ball below the surface. If none of the ball was below the surface, that ball would not be considered hold. And here we go. If no part of the ball is in the hole, below the surface. The ball's not hold, it has to be played as it lies. If the flag stick is removed and the ball moves, whether it falls into the hole or moves away from the hole, there's no penalty. The ball must be replaced on the lip of the hole. That is if you've got a ball where no part of it's below the surface of the ground, therefore it's not considered hold. Then you'd remove the flag stick. If the ball moves, you're just gonna put it right on the lip of the hole. So that's rule 13, putting greens. We didn't cover everything in that rule. So for additional information, please contact us at the Iowa Golf Association and we're happy to help.